So this evening we have to complete our all too brief survey of Neoplatonism. And we have chosen a semi-detached personality uh, to explain certain phases of this doctrine. There were many direct disciples of the original Neoplatonic group, but the influence of the sect extended beyond the boundaries of its own formal pattern and touched particularly some of the nobler and most enlightened of the Roman leaders. We have a very bad general opinion of the Caesars, and for the most part, perhaps, our opinion is not ill-founded. Probably none of them were quite as bad as they have been painted, and very few of them as good as might be hoped. The two exceptions in this group of imperial persons are Marcus Aurelius Antoninus and Flavius Claudius Julianus. These two men were both learning and by natures and temperaments devout. They were sincere, honorable persons. And while the circumstances of their time certainly prevented them from a full expression either of their natural inclination or their potential genius, they have left important monuments, works which have inspired the world far outside of the spheres of policy and diplomacy. The meditations of Marcus Aurelius are among the noblest of the moral works of man. And the writings and uh, various essays and pronouncements of the Emperor Julian must also be included among the great documents. In fact, his two orations, one to the sovereign son and the other to the mother of the gods, are outstanding among the great literary works of the world. We must, for instance, pause and consider the materials and situations that went into the temperament of Julianus. He was directly descended from Constantine the Great, and his <coughs> political career reached its height in the years not far removed from the reign of Constantine. You'll remember that Constantine gathered the great Christian council of Nicaea, and there in about 326 A.D., turned the destiny of the Roman Empire over to Christendom. This policy was not especially altered thereafter except for a few brief interludes. And one of these interludes relates to the life of Julian. Julian was born of the imperial line, but came early in life under the jealousy of Constantius, who was then emperor, and who feared that the descendants of Constantine might ultimately take away his imperial place and life. Constantius, therefore, was responsible for the murder of all the descendants that could be traced of the imperial branch of the family of Constantine, with the exception of Julian and his brother. These two children were so young and so far removed from the political scene that it was not considered necessary to eliminate them. Julian spent his entire life his early life, in exile and in prison. Constantius took no chances with the young man, but prevented him from any having any of the natural privileges of the young, although, as Julian himself tells us, he was never physically or actually abused. 
as a result of the peculiar seclusion and semi-state of imprisonment in which he lived, the young man early turned his mind uh, to the deeper problems of life and thought. During the period of his youth and adolescence, he came rather strongly under the influence of Christian teachers. And as a result of the natural mystical sensitivity of his soul, he was inclined to embrace these teachings. Although, as he tells us, he was profoundly suspicious due to the circumstances involving Constantine the Great. He knew, as he tells us, that Constantine was not sincere and that the entire problem of the great Nicene upheaval was a pretext used by Constantine to advance his own political destiny. But Julian, being by temperament a mystic, a naturally sensitive, retiring, quiet person, was not completely converted by his Christian associates, but he was impressed by them. And uh, the more he considered the matter, the more deeply he was impressed, until he finally accepted baptism. And it was assumed that his life would then follow the new pattern of life in the Holy Roman Empire. It so happened, however, that Constantius, becoming more and more involved in foreign wars and internal broils, began to seek for someone upon whom he could depend and whom he could trust. In the meantime, the Empress, Eusebia, had taken a very great interest in young Julian. She saw in him a man growing into manhood with great and unusual capacities and abilities. She was therefore able to convince Constantius that it would be wise for him to turn to this kinsman, a man honorable and sincere, <coughs> and put his trust, perhaps in the person he had so grievously wronged. Constantius agreed. In the due course of time, Julian was proclaimed Caesar by Constantius, and given a sphere of activity beyond the Alps. This was the beginning of the career of this young man, who gradually, by his own merits, and also to a degree, by the general collapse of the Roman Empire around him, came finally to the imperial purple, and was proclaimed Julian Augustus after it became evident, evident that Constantius had lost the empire. Julian was born in Constantinople, and when the time came for him to solemnize as Pontifex Maximus, at the funeral of Constantius, he ordered the former emperor to be buried as he wished with Christian rites, although by this time Julian himself had changed his mind on some of these religious questions. It was known that while C as Caesar, he extended the influence of Rome and protected it very largely, his own mind had gradually been changing. And as a result of this change, Julian finally formally renounced Christianity and restored or returned to the faith of his fathers. For this reason, he has been stigmatized in the church as Julian the Apostate. But actually, the circumstances leading to the various changes in his mind and thinking were perfectly natural of the kind of man that he was. Julian had a very short career as emperor, and two years after he had become invested with the full imperial power, he died on the field of battle, pursuing a defeated Persian army. Thus, for only a short time, did this man enjoy worldly power and glory, and Julian, one of the best emperors Rome ever had, departed from this world in his 32nd year. Thus he had little, if any, time to write with his philosophy, to produce out of himself the full maturity of his own thinking. Most of the works of Julian were done in tents on the battlefield. He wrote at night with the lights of lamps and candles. He had no leisure with which to study. And he often said that he regretted profoundly 
the destiny seemingly had demanded of him, that he renounce his allegiance to the Athenian Minerva and accept service in the army of the Roman Zeus. He had much rather remained to the end a scholar, but as this was denied of him, he did the best he could under the circumstances. Although he renounced Christianity as his own religion, Julian, when he issued his own imperial edicts, decreed complete and absolute tolerance within the empire. And at no time can it be truthfully said that he persecuted the Christians or did anything to injure them. It has been noted, perhaps unjustly, however, that he preferred to choose those nearest to himself from among the schools of philosophy with which his mind was most closely associated. Basically and fundamentally, Julian was a Platonist. But during his life, he came strongly under the influence of Neoplatonism, and this gradually resulted in the maturity of his philosophic thinking. <coughs> Julian also has the distinction of being one of the few Roman emperors who was, act who was actually an initiate of the mysteries. It is known that as Pontifex Maximus, as the emperor, it was customary for the Roman imperial line to assume deification. The Roman emperor was a theocratic ruler. He was a god. And it was therefore his duty to preside over the state mysteries. But as we may suspect from the general state of Rome, the political mysteries of Rome were by no means mature or pure. And very few of the Roman emperors were ever able uh, to receive admission into the greater and deeper schools of philosophy existing in other regions. Julian was one of the exceptions. Julian was initiated into the great mysteries of, the, of Ephesus. He was accepted into the cult of Diana, the great goddess of the Ephesians. And he was initiated in crypts under the city of Ephesus, and his initiator was Maximus the Neoplatonist. Julian also was initiated into the mysteries of the Persian Mithras, from whom he learned, uh, from which mysteries he learned many things, including a new meaning for the mysterious baptism of blood by means of the blood of the Son, the sins of man are washed away. Julian was also initiated in Greece, and therefore cast his lot with that great descent of priest philosophers who have made such rich contributions uh, to our common good. He was initiated into the rites of the goddess Sibylle, sometimes known as the mother of mysteries, the Mata Deorum, the mother of the gods. And it is from these circumstances relating to his own initiation and to his own experiences in the sacred rites that Julian prepared his great oration to the mother of the gods. Now the oration as a great literary work is almost unexcelled. But our principal interest lies not in this literary implication, but between the lines, in the hints arcanely dropped by one who had passed through the rites and therefore was bound by an obligation neither to expose nor to reveal, but to hold most sacred those things in themselves most sacred. Thus we cannot turn to Julian and expect to find an expose of the great mystery system. We can, however, through the references which he himself derives from Platonic and Neoplatonic sources, from the contemporary records of Julian's own life, and from the contents of his great orations and his work, Julian against the Christians, we can find certain indications of the circumstances and the type of mind and the philosophy with which he was familiar. We have said that he died too young to have perfected his system or have made his own mature contributions upon the platform or level of reflection. He was still a young man, groping after many things, but that he had found some things 
we know, and that with the things he had found came great patience and consolation of spirit, so that in his last hours, with the arrow of a Persian soldier in his liver, Julian faced the end with the greatest of serenity, his last words being for the consideration of those around him and not for his own need. He died contrary to all fables and legends to the contrary, in peace with himself and the world, believing deep profoundly in the Platonic doctrine that he had an everlasting estate and that in this everlastingness all good things would be fulfilled. Julian believed himself to be descended from the god Mercury, but this only implies that he was born under the sign ruled by the planet Mercury. This was the common way of distinguishing persons in his time. He believed that the ruling genius of his horoscope was the mysterious invisible parent from whom he came. Julian also had one other strange and rather profound obsession. He firmly believed in rebirth and was convinced that in a previous life he had been Alexander the Great. The fate of Alexander, who also died as a young man, and the circumstances of his death, and many of the incidents in the life of Julian parallel so closely that perhaps there might be some truth in his belief. In any event, he held to it very firmly, going so far as attempting to expiate, as Julian, crimes and sins which he believed that he had committed as Alexander. So with this little outline of the, of the character and manner of Julian, but with no ability to enter into the strange and wonderful genius of this man, who had talents and abilities uh, far above those of the average person, we must consider his approach to religion. Now here we have an interesting problem uh, that perhaps is different from that of any of the other uh, Neoplatonists whom we are considering. Here we have a man who devoutly and honestly became a Christian, then turned from this faith and returned to the doctrines of Plato and Neoplatonism. Yet he had received his Christian education at a very early and tender period of his life, and during those formative and adolescent years he had been strongly impressed by the sincerity and dedication and devotion of certain Christian priests and teachers whom he had known. It was not until public life brought him in contact with the political pressures of the new sect that he became disillusioned. As a young man, he believed very devoutly in the essential goodness of these men with whom he confided and who had taught him. So we have a man returning later to a non-Christian position as a philosopher, scholar, and thinker, and yet undoubtedly bringing with him into this new uh, attitude which he assumed, and we know from his own writings with the absolute sincerity of a dedicated person, that we will have an, a mixture or a combination of elements arising in the philosophy of Julian, uh, which is going to distinguish him somewhat from the other late pagan writers who were pres preserving the Platonic descent. Julian, though a philosopher of good parts, and a scholar of abilities, was essentially in his own personal life a mystic. He was a mystic inasmuch as he was moved most powerfully and strongly from certain deep sources and roots within himself. His writings are colored by tremendous emotional intensity. He had a great and sublime sense of the dignity of life, and like most of the Neoplatonists, his mysticism led him into interpretation. He was not inclined to accept anything upon its face appearance or upon its literal values. He sought always meaning, and he sought meaning that would satisfy the hunger of his own search for truth. Julian had already long realized the truth was not a word, and he had fully come to appreciate that the attainment of internal security was by a kind of exaltation within himself. He on several occasions had transcendental experiences, 
and some of the church fathers accused him of being a magician. Actually, he did have visions. He did have an inner contact of some kind with a larger world of reality, a world which flowing through him, as he himself expresses it, gave him security from himself and not from his world. It was this security that sustained him through the cabals and conspiracies of the Roman court. And it was this same mysterious internal security that left him untouched by elevation and serene in death. So we have in uh, Julian a man who was moved and motivated as far as we can find from every action, every the public pronouncement, every private memoir. A man absolutely dedicated to what he believed to be duty, responsibility, honor, integrity, and truth. He admitted himself that he might not know fully the meaning of any of these words. But that it was as it was given to him to know, that he would do, regardless of cost to himself, regardless of whether it brought him success or death. It brought him death, which has not been unusual in cases of this kind. The great oration to the mother of the gods is a veiled unfoldment of the great rituals of the mysteries. And it is therefore important that we use it as a springboard in an effort to understand the mystery system as it then continued to survive and flourish, although in a few centuries it was to pass away from the pages of history in the western motion of civilization. To Julian, the mother of the gods was the mysteries. Of course, he will not tell us this directly. To do so would violate his obligation. He can only intimate to us the sacred facts involved. The great mother of the gods, Sibylle, presided brooding and serene, strange and detached, over her great rites and ceremonies. Dark Diana, the Multimania, the great mother, Mother of Mysteries, Mother of Life, Goddess of the Ephesians, also brooded strange and mysterious over her sanctuary. She was again but another form of Isis, the Eternal Widow, the Egyptian Mother of Mysteries, seeking moaning and pitiful for the dismembered body of her murdered Lord, Julian recognizes these fables, refers to them, mentions them, and tells us what they all mean. Julian therefore explains, partly in this oration and partly in some of his other works, and deriving intimations from Neoplatonic writers who can further be consulted, that it was the belief of those who had taken the obligations and the vows that in the dawn of time, in the beginning of things, the great wisdom, the eternal gods, have set up their sacred institutions among men, the truth might not perish. And these sacred institutions were guarded generation after generation. And the laws of these institutions and the sacred rites and the ceremonies, the secret instruction, the disciplines, the tests and the trials, were all according to the oracular revelations of the gods themselves, who in the beginnings of time had established these rites and appointed their priests, from whom all the hierophants and masters of the rites from that time on had descended by an ordination, by the same kind of strange, mystic, secret uh, transference of power and authority that we think of in Christianity, under the term the apostolic succession. This succession of rites, preserved through the sacraments and through the laying on of hands and through the dedication of lives, meant that the great institutions had come down always as custodians of the great work. Now man is born into this world from the womb of his mother, and his days are few and full of troubles. 
as according to both pagan and Christian mystic writings. This man who is few of days has only one hope, and that is that by some wonderful and sacred reality beyond his uh, comprehension, he may, while still alive, die and be raised again. Therefore, the sacred institutions were the houses of the second birth, the houses from which a man is born again, from the womb of the mysteries, from the heart, soul, and body of the great mother, who is forever bearing her sons, and yet to the end is forever a virgin. This is the song that Julian sings to us, the song of the house of wisdom, for wisdom has builded its house, and here it dwells waiting for its sons. This wisdom is Pallas Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, the crown city, the queen of the house of learning. This is Sibylle, Melita, Astarte, Ista, all the great mothers, the mothers of rights, the mothers who give birth to the immortal sons who never die. The ritual perhaps began in Egypt, for it is certain that there Isis mourning for her lord represents the great institution of the state religion. Isis was not primarily uh, regarded in the mysteries as a person, but was the bride of heaven. In the Apocalypse of John, which derives part of its authority from the rites of Phrygia, which were practiced in the area around Patmos, where it is said John was for long exiled. In these rites, we have a new understanding from the book of Revelation of the mystery of the bridegroom and the marriage of the city of Jerusalem to the land. And Jerusalem was adorned as a bride. This marriage of Jerusalem to the Lamb of Heaven is the story that lies at the root of the great cycle of Isis and Osiris. Actually, Osiris represents the eternal wisdom principle. Isis is consort is his house, or his institution in the world. Isis, therefore, represents the great theocratic order, just as truly as the same is perpetuated in Christianity under the symbolism of the Virgin Mary. Isis, the Virgin Mary, Sibylle, and the great Diana are therefore the magnificent organizations or institutions built up out of the world for the worship and adoration of the gods. This is, again, a very interesting psychical or psychological mystery. For the temple is always the symbol of the human soul. The temple is suspended like man's soul between spirit and body. A spirit descends from the invisible and divine world to possess and end soul. So the psychic nature itself, the human soul, ascending out of the complication and mystery of matter, rises from its own mortality and sphinx-like guards the gates of wisdom. This soul, then, redeemed out of body, purified from body, is the holy city, the new Jerusalem of St. Augustine. And it is the human soul that is then the bride of the Lamb. And the great theocratic and sacerdotal systems of the pagan world were regarded as these sacred cities that became united eternally to the god who was their patron deity. Now in the Isis and Osiris cycle, Osiris, the great one, or the great deity, is foully murdered by his own brother. And Isis, the mistress, becomes widowed and barren. And she puts upon her head sackcloth and ashes. And she goes forth weeping for her Lord, 
seeking always and forever uh, for the mysterious power, the great rites, the secret lost word that must be found, or the great arcana cannot be restored. And Isis seeking for her Lord is, as we might say it, the concept of knowledge, the concept of education, the great concept of universities and colleges as we know them today. To the ancients they would have been the widowed Isis weeping for her Lord, searching everywhere for him, but not able to find him. This quest is the quest for knowledge, the eternal search for the eternal vanity. Now in the Isis Osiris cycle, while Isis is wandering in her widow's weeds, searching for that which is lost forever, there appears to her the specter of her own deceased husband. Osiris comes in the form of the Holy Spirit. Osiris comes in the form of the Holy Ghost. And he comes to announce to her that she shall bear a son and that this son shall be for the salvation of the nations. And therefore it is said that Isis conceived of the Holy Spirit of her own deceased husband, and she brought, brought forth Horus the younger, the child that was born after his father was dead, in fact was conceived after his father was dead. Therefore he was born of a Holy Spirit, he was a widow's son. He was one dedicated to a strange and wonderful destiny. And Typhon, the assassin of Osiris and the wicked brother, discovering that this child had been born, sent forth emissaries to all parts of Egypt to discover the child and slay him. And in this course there is also reference to the slaughter of innocent children who were mistaken for him. But Isis, guided by Mercury, hid her child where none could find it, hiding it in the reeds by the side of the river Nile. And the child was saved and grew up to be a fine and splendid man. And when this had occurred, and when the time came for the child lock of hair to be cut off, and Horus came into his adolescent period, which is the second period of life in ancient Egypt, on and then, uh, Isis received from the ghost of her husband, Osiris, the promise that he would be forever present with this child and would guide him and lead him. And when Horus the Younger reached his thirtieth year, which was the Egyptian age of maturity, on that occasion a strange and wonderful thing happened. For at that time Osiris, the god himself, entered into the body of his own son and was born in him and took over and became the ruler of that body so that in this mystery as the ancient Egyptian papyrus tells us the father and the son were identical and then it was that Osiris proudly cries out who has seen the father has seen the son for the son is in the father the father is in the son and they are one being to eternity this was pronounced a thousand years B.C. Now this mystery goes into many ramifications, but Osiris always represents the great mystery itself, the eternal truth, the living power. And Isis, widow of her Lord, is the priesthood, the sacerdotal institutions, the schools of the mysteries, and the son that is born of the invisible spirit and the widowed wife is Horus the Harshesta, the son of the hawk, the redeemer, the light bearer, the intercessor, the one who stands in the hall of judgment with every soul that dies and pleads with the father for the forgiveness of its sin. And Horus is the one when the soul of the dead person seems to be lost, takes upon itself the sin of the dead, and in therefore, and in that way, gains its redemption. These old rites and mysteries go way back. Julian knew them. Julian had been through the sacred rites. He knew what their meanings were, 
and what they portended in a world seeking truth. And so Isis is the great house, the house of God on earth. Isis was the many roomed chambers of initiation, the dark hidden womb from which flow the ever born ones, the sons of the hawk, the armies of the redeemed, who shall sometime in the last great war, which is the Armageddon, will be locked in eternal struggle with the powers of darkness, and in the end, in those times beyond eternity and time, right shall be victorious, and the kingdom shall be returned to Osiris the Father, who will come and glow in glory, and receive unto himself his beloved Son. All these rites are not the theological stories that we know today. They had a much deeper and more precious meaning to the initiates of that time. But the great Diana, mother of the Ephesians, the brooding power of the moon, hovering over the great temple of Ephesus, was likewise this mysterious story of the psychic content and the building of the human soul and how through the union of a Holy Spirit invisible and a corporeal body, the mother, there is born the radiant soul which is the salvation of the world. This in turn causes the initiate or the adeptus of the ancient rites to be considered as a personification and embodiment of the principal <laughs> soul. Here we can pause for just a second and remind you of the heroic estate we described last week in the wanderings of Ulysses. The heroes are the soul beings, those who have built for themselves this house, this tabernacle within, which is to be their habitation. So through the power of the mysteries, the breath of life is breathed into a man and he becomes a living being. And this living being is the psychic entity, the mysterious energy or power of the soul. Julianus tells us some more of these things, and he points out something that I think is very interesting. He points out that in these rites, whether they be at Samothrace or Ephesus, whether they be uh, among the Phrygians or in the, uh, in the mysteries of the Goths and the Gauls, all of these rites were presented in the forms of great pageantries. The pageantries of Elysus are particularly remembered but they were no more remarkable or important than those practiced in other places. The neophyte, seeking admission into these rites, and having passed through certain preparatory examinations and tests, is brought into the ceremony, and there he is a witness. He is a beholder. Uh, what uh, he was is perhaps borrowed from a line in Plato, because Plato, at initiate, was once asked his profession, and he replied, I am a spectator. This means, of course, that he accepted the entire pageantry of life as a drama of initiation. Although very few modern writers, including dear old Jowett, ever realized that fact. In the rituals, Apuleius, who preceded Julian in these rites, and Hadrianus, and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, who also was initiated at Ephesus. All of these who went before joined with Julian in bearing testimony to something uh, that is undoubtedly the secret and the very heart of the mystery. They all declared that when they entered into the temple as candidates for the mysteries or for initiation, that they actually went through an experience. Apollonius of Tyana, at a still earlier date than these men, had testified to the same thing. Namely, that when they entered the house of the goddess, or the great house of the mother, that is, they returned to the womb for a second birth, that an occurrence or a happening took place which could not be explained in any terms or any words known to man. As the great drama of initiation unfolded, 
from the soul of the candidate, the story of the truth behind the picture was revived or restored. So that as the ancient initiate said, the soul or the psychic entity within himself stirred in its sleep, awoke and remembered the long road it had come and realized the reason for its own journey. Thus in some way the rituals brought about from the individual a restoration of his own psychic memory. There are many answers to how this could have been. Some of the profane and not too happy uh, commentators on these subjects have suggested that the candidates were hypnotized or that they were drugged or that something was done to disorder their senses so that they seemed to pass through impossible situations. I doubt if either was true. I think the answer lies in the ritual itself. Remember, these rites were preserved inviolate, without change, upon the strongest admonition of the gods and the oracles. Not one line, not one motion, not one word could be altered. It must be preserved complete, inviolate. Man must add nothing and take away nothing. For the peculiar power of the right lay in its own structure and the unfoldment which it accomplished. Those who have written briefly upon these ceremonies, particularly those who passed through them and could not say much, and some who arcanely concealed them under subterfuge and veiled term, particularly I'm thinking of the uh, point uh, the Grecian poet Aristophanes, who in his frogs and his winds, two of his supposed comedies, gives us part of the ritual. These rites unfolded according to a peculiar sequence. As Plotinus says, they opened like a flower and bore their fruit. The entire situation was so perfectly and completely ordered that in some mysterious way it brought about some of the chemistry, some of the psychic chemistry implied by Plotinus in his essay on the beautiful, which we have also described. In the rites, then, as in the approach of beauty, the soul in man was said to burst forth in joy, to embrace its own likeness. Thus the rituals were a magnificent, integrated, psychological structures which could rouse through reminiscence, through recollection, through similarity, and through association, the sleeping remembrances that are locked within the psychic life of the individual. These rituals then call him forth out of the darkness of his own sleep and cause him to awaken and while the rites were proceeding, he lived them, he experienced them, because they were unfolding in tone and order and picture and color and design the very structure of his own psychic life. He responded because they were revealing to him an absolute similitude of his own soul. A man being thus brought into the presence of that which is himself, and recognizing those patterns and pageantries which instinctively he receives and responds to by ancient instincts which he cannot even explain or understand. These rituals then were mandalas. They were concentration fields by which the disciple or the candidate was lured from the darkness of his own sleep. In him then the soul which had slumbered, which had been unable to rouse itself by its own vigilance alone, was able to be revived and to be restored to its own waking state. Those who attained this or received this apotheosis within themselves were said to have been like a Pulius, 
brought forth into the presence of the great and glorious God. And in this procedure were enabled to revive the divine memory, the intuitive power, the inspirational faculty which had slept within them since the time of their embodiment in form. Julian implies to us all of this. He tells us then that these things are not just dramas. They are something in themselves ineffable and sublime, worthy of admiration, and suitable to cause the one who passes through them uh, to come to the greatest devotion and to the most utter and complete humility. Plato is said to have referred to the rites of Elisus in such terms of approbation uh, that the importance of these ceremonies cannot be doubted. For he tells us that in the presence of the great rituals he was as a small child knowing nothing. This, however, was not due to instruction. The rituals did not teach they released. They caused the individual to see almost dream symbolic equivalents of his own psychic life. And this brings us to a situation that might have considerable bearing upon modern thinking. We are now concerned in analytical psychological research with the problem of the interpretation of symbolic patterns from within the subconscious and the unconscious of man. We feel that man is moving from within outward through the projection from himself of symbolic forms which bear witness uh, to the geometrical proportions of his own psychic life. Therefore, the individual in his dreams or in his waking dreams, in his instinctive likes and dislikes, in the decisions and choices which he makes, in the person he may choose to marry, in his attitude towards life and his world, in all these things, the individual is drawing something from himself, is causing symbolic forms and shadows to come to the surface from the deep sources and fountains of his own existence. Now the difference between this and the great rituals of the, of the mother of the gods may be worthy of our consideration. For in these rituals, the qualities with which man is most concerned are lured from himself by presentation of symbol to him and not merely released through him in a heterogeneous collection of dissonant elements. In other words, if these symbolic forms which come from man represent uh, various impersonations of his instincts, then these instincts have potential forms or symbolical equivalents. And if the most divine of these instincts are pictured to man, he will experience them and find that these pictures will call upon his own inner remembrances and release these symbolic patterns from within himself. In the common ordinary life of man, most of his environmental circumstances do not directly release because they are in themselves asymmetrical. They are in themselves compromises, materialistic emphases, and the individual is not in the presence of sheer beauty, nor is he in the presence of sheer goodness, as far as man is capable of contriving these terms or the elements and principles for which they stand. So the neophyte or the candidate for initiation enters the secret house, he isolates himself from the world. He enters into another kind of world, which might be likened in itself to his own inner life. He discovers, like the Melchizedek mystery of old, that in the rebirth of his own inner life he must be his own father and his own mother. He enters into these rites, into an unworldly state of detachment from all material things, from all normal or materialistic instincts and appetites. And here, in an atmosphere of the most detached sanctity, in an atmosphere itself redundant with beauty, full of love and nobility, always in gentleness, peace, and dignity, 
the neophyte advances toward the pageantries by which he is supposed to be so profoundly touched. And gradually the great spectacles open before him. And he beholds not the gods or their strange ways and symbols, but he beholds a series of pictures which are the reflections of his own heart and mind. Each of the things that happen breaks silences within himself and cause him to become articulate of ideals and principles and beliefs. As this rushing unfoldment takes him, he may then very well pass into a state of enthusiasm, uh, which is from entheus, meaning in God. He may find himself suddenly possessed by powers beyond his comprehension, moved by forces that he cannot resist, until it seems that an internal world bursts through him and around him. And he finds himself like a Puleus, standing at midnight upon the threshold of Persephone, with the great, radiant and glorious sun of noon shining under his feet. He beholds himself transported from one sphere or world to another. He enters into the abode of the dead, the dead being the dark part of himself. He there faces all of the pressures, evils, and symbolic fantasies of his own psyche. He is victorious over darkness and evil. He is restored again to light. He remains three days in the underworld, or three degrees. Then he is resurrected and brought into the presence of the Hierophant of the Mysteries, the Grand Master in his robes of blue and gold. And here he is crowned and coroneted as a master of the inner life. And he is presented with the symbols and powers of his new authority. But long before these things have happened, as Apuleius points out, the soul itself has become so completely enamored of the transcendental beauty of the divine that it is no longer scarcely to be considered in this world at all. It moves strangely as in a sleep of waking. It beholds all things in new order and relationship. It beholds gradually the breaking open of the walls of the temple until, as one of the initiates says, all vanished except time and space and heaven and earth and the whole world became the eternal temple. All these things were experiences strangely and wonderfully psychologically released by the great pageantry of the rites. And because of the tremendous power of these rites, with their mantrams, with their songs, with their sacred circumambulations, with the mystic dances of the muses and the graces, and all the strange parts of these stories, that which finally ended brought with it a complete and tremendous apotheistic change within the consciousness of the neophyte. He became the initiate. Not because his mind had accepted the instruction, not as be because simply his emotions had been purified or cleansed, for these cathartic disciplines came first. He was an initiate because of a complete transcendent experience, an experience which could never be assailed by his own reason, which could never be denied by his own mind, because he had been there, because this had happened to him, and because in the course of the great ritual he had come face to face with the gods themselves. Now were these gods truly masked priests? They may have been. But also every mask, every robe, every symbol was chosen with a strange and wonderful skill. The gods the man saw may have been masked priests, but the gods that came to him from within himself were not. <coughs> For these various shadows man made, even with the greatest solemnity and care, became in themselves and sold. And these images of divine things, as Plotinus calls them, become strange magical agents, drawing to themselves the real principles for which they stand, so that that which is in the likeness of the God is never entirely separate from the God because the believer can experience the God in the likeness. And that which comes to the person who understands or accepts the mystery is not the symbol, but the substance or energy 
which is released through the symbol. Having repeated, received the rite, the initiate then goes forth upon the porch of the temple, and he finds that the citizens of the villages around and of the towns have all gathered for the wonderful ceremony of receiving him back again into the world of the objectively living, for he has gone down into the great mystery. He has returned to the womb of eternity. He has been born again of the Great Mother, and he has come forth out of his alma mater, for the form is preserved even in our present university system, although the meaning is lost. He comes forth out of the mother of learning, but he has not been taught by the mind alone. He has been taught by the soul in a mystery. And he is hailed on the pillars, of, as he stands between the pillars of the porch, he is hailed as one twice born, the reborn one. He is then proclaimed not any longer as a wise man or a student or a great teacher or something of that kind. The initiate of the mysteries had a strange and unique place which has never been filled since the decay or decline of that system. He was a being like God. The king of the country could not be seated in his presence without his permission. Every door was open to him. No one would dare to deny him anything that he asked, but for the strangeness of, thought, of circumstance, he never asked for anything. He was strangely and completely aloof, and yet he was, of the, he was in this world, but not of it. He labored, he served, he taught, he worked, and when the fullness of his years were done, he went to sleep in the earth like his brothers who had not been initiated. But he lived forever in a state of immortality, because within himself he knew that he could not die. He had returned to the gate of death, and had come back again. He had passed through this complete internal release of the psychic nature of his own soul. And as such, he was a Mahatma, a great soul in the Indian language. And this great, our illumined soul, as Julianus tells us, then sings the great and glorious hymn to the Mother of Mysteries because she is the custodian, the faithful guardian, the forever keeping of all that is true and beautiful and noble and good. She is the soul itself, the beloved of all nations, the desired of all peoples. Now the temple being as it was a peculiar emblem of the soul, the rise of the mysteries were represented in two degrees or stages. Whereas the body of man carries within itself the sanctum sanctorum or the secret part of the heart. So within the heart of man the temple of the mysteries is built. And within man's own psychic life certain things must happen before the temple which is everlasting can be built. Here we have much symbolism which can find easy parallel in the story of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the building of Solomon's temple. All these rites and ceremonies have the same meaning. But the house that is built without the sound of hammers or the voice of workmen eternal in the heavens is of course the everlasting house of the soul, the mysterious temple, the mysterious body of the great psychic mother, Sophia Asimov the great mother of the Gnosis. So Sophia, or the Virgin of Wisdom, is a house that can never be profaned, the mystery whose veil cannot be lifted, but who waits forever for the return of her sons, like the, the patient Penelope weaves forever the mysterious fabric of destiny. All these things have something to tell us about the religious system of that time and what the secret of it was. We read frequently in various books 
of men trying to understand in this late time what was the power that maintained the mystery system for 4,000 years in the ancient world? What was it that caused the rich, the powerful, the great, the strong, the wise, the learned, and the simple, all to hold this system in the most extraordinary admiration? What was it that was so strangely and wonderfully powerful that during its flourishing and its flowering, it produced the greatest minds and hearts and souls the world has ever known. It was in some way this mysterious power of actually releasing through its rituals a symbolic, mystical experience. The early church undoubtedly sensed this because it created in its own form and in its own way the mystical Christian equivalent to the pagan rite and that was the mystery of the Mass. The Mass was originally a mystical ceremony intended to convey certain parts of the old ritual. For the Mass as we know it, particularly the ceremony of the Eucharist, goes far back in Egypt and into the Dionysiac rites of Greece. But in some mysterious way, the Mass did not attain or achieve the purpose which was exemplified in the pagan ritual. That the Mass produced a very deep and profound sense of sublimity cannot be questioned. That a high Mass at St. Peter's today is one of the most tremendous religious experiences that man can pass through cannot be doubted. We know these things to be true. And yet in some way, this ceremonial, this tremendous pageantry did not and does not accomplish what the ancient rituals did accomplish. What then was the essential difference? Julianus says very simply one thing, and this is the basis of his great argument against the Christians. Julianus says that the difference lay in the disciplinatory rites. In other words, Julian says in his arguments that the criers of the pagan mysteries are those who call uh, the uh, neophytes to their labors, said, let only the pure of heart enter here. Let only the dedicated come. Let only the, those who in themselves had achieved and attained be permitted to mingle in this sacred throng. The idea or principle being that in these ancient rites, religion or the religious experience was not bestowed, it was earned. This perhaps does have a large bearing on it. Perhaps Julian, who knew both and had experienced both, was in a better position to say than we are today because we cannot experience both. But Julian's opinion was definite that before the individual can have this experience occur within himself, he must have attained to a certain level of merit. Plato and Pythagoras required certain prerequisites to admission into their sacred schools. Perhaps these prerequisites were to a degree symbolical, for we know that Pythagoras initiated his own slaves and it is not likely that these slaves possessed the literal prerequisites which he required. But somewhere in this was a symbolism which had to do with merit or the earning of the right of acceptance into the state religion. So Julian says that the great difference lay in that, that the pagan required and demanded that those who sought truth make in themselves a proving of their own merit or their own sincerity and that they might not enter the sanctuary except with clean hands and an upright heart. He says that the God of the mysteries was not saving the sinners but was rewarding the just. Now this makes a peculiar difference in the, in the psychology involved. 
and he was turned from his Christian baptism essentially by this particular circumstance, that he believed firmly that the individual who sought the consolation of God must bring something with him and not merely accept, not pray for what he wants and continue to live the way he pleases, not to hope for good things but do nothing in himself, not to continue his common course of profane action and at the same time feel justified in claiming his participation in a religious mystery that the marriage system was at the end of the source of all these things. Now it is quite possible that it is not possible or not realistic that the sacraments which are performed to, in the presence of persons who are themselves not consecrated can have the same type of result as those in which the person is duly and properly prepared for this experience. Another thing that is, of course, great of importance in this is that religion in, under this system, the philosophic culture of religion, was a decision of the individual himself. Men were not born into faith. They did not join their faith because their friends did, or because their relatives were members or because it was particularly suitable to the location in which they lived. These kinds of considerations played no part in the old mystery rites. The individual prepared himself for five, from five to twenty years of study, of self-control and discipline. Before he could approach the temple, he must bring from the community in which he lived proper credentials proving that during this entire time he had been an outstanding citizen on the level of ethics, that he had performed no action that was contrary to the public good, that he was honest, intelligent, generous, kind, well-integrated and well-ordered, that he possessed courage and self-discipline, that he had proceeded in the gymnasium to attain certain scholastic levels, that he was in every way dedicated and had given his whole life to the search for truth. Only then was he considered eligible for participation in the great orgies of the blessed God. An orgy at that time had no such meaning as we ascribe to it today. It represented the great, strange, mysterious, and intoxicating pageantry of the soul in which consciousness was picked up into an incredible exaltation and elevation of experience. So these things led Julian to feel and to believe that the mysteries of the Great Mother and of the Blessed Goddess were reserved for those who were true, that were re and were reserved for the individual who was willing to sacrifice all else in the service of the great goddess. And until that decision was complete within consciousness, her rights could not be experienced because the soul itself was not ready. On a modern psychological level, I think we can begin to appreciate some of the possibilities of this and can think of it in terms of a potential problem in psychotherapy. Today, we are confronted with the great need of man organizing, purifying, redeeming his own psychic content. We know that the average person is burdened with a variety of pressures, intensities, frustrations of any and all kinds, that he is incapable of the relaxation and integration of a well-ordered life. Book learning will not save him. Allegiance to organizations will not save him. The only thing that can save him is the reduction of his own psychic pressure. Now in psychotherapy today, we attempt to exhaust these pressures by certain therapeutic techniques, releasing the individual uh, from the delusion or illusion which is causing his condition. It is conceivable, however, that society can produce 
and should produce individuals who by their own actions have prevented a neurotic condition from taking hold of themselves and or having had such a, neuro a neurosis have had victory over it by the conquest of the things that cause it. Today on psychological levels we are working mostly with effects and by the time we get an individual cleared from one complex he is ready to fall into another. Such is the pressure of our time. And such it will continue until his proclivity to become complicated. His natural instinct to be psychotic is overcome or changed by some greater instinct taking hold of his own consciousness. The soul, burdened by the pressures of our own psychic delusions, is transformed into a chimera a monster of strange and distorted appearance and form. And this monster in turn prevents uh, the individual having the experience of his own psychic identity. The troubled soul cannot find its own heart, its own integration. For that reason in modern times we could contemplate very seriously the possibility of bringing the soul itself back to normalcy, back to integration by the dedication of the faculties of our minds and the emotions of our hearts to the restoration of the integrity of our own soul. This was the discipline of the mysteries. This is the one great part of knowledge that we have forgotten. And it is the failure to remember this that has brought the whole house of knowledge down about our ears. It is because the individual has forgotten that he can bring only himself to the house of the mysteries. And if that self is inadequate or improperly integrated, he finds not reality but illusion in the strange, dark, subterranean passageways of the secret house. It is therefore the great problem in wisdom for man to realize that his own confusion creates error, that he can be no more true than he is integrated, that he can be no more wise than he is at peace within himself. Until these elements and factors are recognized, the great rites or the ceremonies are not for him. Perhaps in earlier days, when life was less pressureful, the psychotic needs of man were not as strenuous as they are today, nor the demands upon his psychic energy is so great. But certainly today, we are in desperate need of the restoration of the great mystery system of education. The education that begins with the integration of self. The education that advances only as rapidly as the individual proves by his own integrated abilities that it is safe for him to proceed in the great adventure of learning. For if he proceeds unqualified, he will ultimately be faced for the riddle of the Sphinx and will perish along the road of his search. Julianus then tells us these things, and we can then say to ourselves, what manner of man was Julianus? By means of which, reaching the end of his life at 32, he had still achieved sufficient of this mysterious ability to have merited initiation in himself. We may say, Julianus wasn't perfect, how did he do it? Why did they accept him, a young man? with probably but inadequate resources, and certainly no maturity in his real philosophic life. There is an interesting thing that uh, comes into this also. Julianus, like all accepted candidates in the mysteries, was finally chosen by Oracle. In other words, uh, the candidate's final acceptance depended upon some uh, testimony coming from the gods themselves. In other words, he must be accepted. Many are called, but few are chosen. 
Men may be called out of the world by the instincts of their own natures, but they are chosen by the divine powers. So what was it that caused, or might have caused, the acceptance, the acceptance of Julianus? One of the old <coughs> legends, and one of the stories about him, tells us that when he came into the, uh, into the uh, presence of Maximus the Neoplatonist, uh, while he was waiting for the initiation into the Mithraic ceremonies uh, at Ephesus, this Neoplatonist embraced him with great love, and said, My son, you have come back. That which you have already done has come to life in you. And he explained to Julian that in his previous embodiment he had accepted the right, and therefore that he might receive it again. And because of this, it would be possible for him to restore the right in his own consciousness. If this was not true, he could not. But because he had already received the mistress, then and then, for that reason, for him, learning was a remembering of that which was already known. And uh, Maximus further explained to Julian something that the boy himself knew, and which was, of course, perhaps the deciding factor, namely that from his own infancy, Julian had had this great pressing desire within himself to know. He, he was born as he tells us himself, seeking truth. Therefore, he could well believe, perhaps, that the soul in him, whether it was the soul of Alexander or some other uh, spirit in space, that the soul in him had already known the road and was longing to find it again. That this, then, by initiation, was the reviving or restoring of that knowledge which the soul already possessed but which had been obscured to it by its embodiment as a newborn babe. And because Maximus the Neoplatonist recognized in Julian the signs of one who had taken the oath, he was accepted and initiated. And from what transpired then and afterwards, it seems that Maximus very probably was right. Because certainly Julian, considering his age and his circumstances, almost immediately revealed a wisdom far beyond his years, or far out of harmony with the generation and the condition of the world in which he lived, because Julian definitely belonged to the golden age of Greece. He belonged to centuries that had preceded him. He was a great geographical misfit, coming too late and dying too soon. So in this case, there was this uh, peculiar circumstance involved in his acceptance into the right. And he and other Neoplatonists remind, uh, reminded their students uh, that where this gift, this power, this strange and inevitable destiny to press on to truth is strong and clear and bright within the human soul, that that soul is telling us that it has at some previous time passed through the gates of the house of the mother, that it has received in the past its sacred name, its ordination, and is now only seeking to remember that it may go on to learn more of the mystery. Now we know even in this time, and certainly in the many years of public work that I've gone through, I know that the world is divided into two very general groups of people. Those in whom there is this tremendous urge uh, to know. This urge to release a spiritual destiny locked within themselves. An urge which in its proper and natural form is not an urge to achieve fame or greatness or wealth or authority nor is it an urge to escape burdens or to shift responsibility or to advance one's own spiritual destiny. It is the simple urge to learn in order that we may give. And wherever this urge is tremendously strong, we cannot but wonder, as Julian wondered, whether it isn't the dim remembrance of the soul, of a destiny to which it has already been called by the sacred rites, when it was dedicated 
uh, to the service of the great mother who is the servant of all. And then there are other souls in whom this hunger does not seem to be, who are happy and content to live their normal lives, who find no call, no pressure, no sublimity to disturb their mortal inclinations. These souls have not been moved, they have not been to the house, they have not tread upon the threshold of the goddess, they have not seen the great gods standing in the light before them. Julian felt this, believed it completely, and there is a something about our own daily living after all this time that seems to intimate that perhaps he was right. At least we have probably no better explanation. We see the same phenomenon within the structure of modern religion, where we find some who are by such nature devout, that they are completely led by a goodness in themselves, so that it would make no difference to what sect they belonged, they would still be good. And there are others that no matter to what sect they give allegiance, are still not good. This difference seems to be something within the psyche. And to the Greeks it meant that in the psyche of the individual who had passed through the mysteries at some previous time was a record waiting to be awakened. That it could be awakened very quickly and very easily under the proper circumstances and pressures. So Julian was accepted and apparently he received the full benefit of his strange rite and ritual. For he tells us much of his own longings and his dreamings and his hopings as he tries to unfold without unveiling the mysteries of the Great Mother. Also in this story, or in the um, orations of Julian, he divides the universe into two essential parts. He describes to us the rituals and mysteries of the Sovereign Son. And the Sovereign Son, of course, to him, was this visible symbol of the invisible power of eternal life. To him, the Son was the Father of all living, and the Earth, the Mistress, was the Mother of all living. In the union of the Sun and Moon, and the mysterious alchemical experimentation produced the psychic homunculus, the mysterious creature of crystal, in whom the two great sets of energies converged, mingled, and produced from themselves the magnificent structure of the living soul. The Neoplatonists taught, for example, uh, that there was spirit and body, and between these two, as a spider spinning its web, the mysterious interchange of energies and forces brought into creation a middle distance, which was the psychic nature. For the soul was the result of life moving upon matter, and matter rising gradually, impregnated with life, and releasing life from itself. So the earth also was the womb of the mysteries, the great mother, and her temples were mostly beneath the earth, as symbolic of their proper place and residence. And the mother was impregnated to the power of the light, or the father spirit. And between this heaven and earth dominion wielding was fashioned the subtle fabric of the soul. Now Pythagoras and the others declare that a soul is properly called a form. Form and matter are not the same thing. All bodies are forms. All bodies are composed of matter. But there are forms of matter which are without bodies. And there are forms uh, which are without spirits. These mysterious things are described in the mysteries of Iamblichus of the Chaldeans and the Egyptians. But what we are told in substance is that when matter is impregnated with life, when substance receives into itself the archetypal pattern of universal law, matter suddenly is brought into magnificent geometric arrangements. Matter is itself a form but formless. Life is unformed. 
the potential of form within itself. And just as matter and energy unite in the production of the snowflake, so the snowflake becomes a form, because a form is a compound of life and substance, of mind and matter, of consciousness and the elements. And the form, therefore, is body that has been fashioned from matter and designed by consciousness. And the two, matter and consciousness, through their integration, produce the radiant specter of the human soul. So form and the soul are the same things. For all souls are formal structures, and a form is a, an aggregation of substances around a pattern, a design, or a purpose. So the most minute creatures that we see, a little crustacea and foraminifera and things of that nature, are forms like little snowflakes. Wherever, wherever life takes a bone in matter, it begins to mold matter into form. And form is a symbolic description or exhibition of life's process. And the human soul is therefore the symbolic representation of the state of man's growth in relation to his spiritual cause and his material body. This in turn means that the soul or the psychic part, is responding more subtly and more immediately to consciousness than body does, is therefore more easily affected and more quickly inspired and more subtly influenced than body. And the purpose of the mysteries is to recognize that these institutions themselves were the physical symbols of the world soul. And because they were physical symbols, they were built in certain ways. And we can begin to understand why in the Dionysiac rites of Greece the orders of architecture were brought in, the five great orders and the polyglot orders that followed them. For these orders of architecture were required in the building of temples because the temples were dedicated to various deities, that is, to various psychic complexes or patterns. And each temple had to be the complete and perfect representation in stone of the psychic archetype which belonged to that god or deity. Pythagoras, visiting in Egypt, said that he found in the temples there strange images of the gods, because all of the divine beings of the Egyptian hierarchy were, were represented by symmetrical geometric solids of various shapes and arrangements. In other words, that all the gods were reduced to geometric formulas. The geometric formula, in its turn, is amplified or expanded into the temple, which must have its pillars, either Doric or Ionian or Corinthian, according to the deity who dwelt there. The structures of the temples themselves were based upon basic star patterns, as we learn from the Caesarano edition of Vitruvius. We know that every one of these tasks was appointed with the same care, assuming that man himself builds his outer body from the very texture and structure of his own psychic life, so building the temples of the gods. It was necessary that each temple should in every part and detail be true to the god which it represented, because it was his house. And unless, as we are learning from the Bible, unless we build a temple according to the law, that is the law of order and proportion, the living God will not dwell therein. For the God, the power, the dynamic, the psychic reality of the archetype can only be captured when the structure which is to house it is identical with it. In the same way, man is only able to capture the archetype of the great mystery drama if his own psychic organism is identical with it. This strange rapport uh, was of two directions or two kinds. Man could not be sure and could not know that his own psychic nature was identical with that of the gods. But through the oracles of the sacred and ancient institutions, the initiated priests were convinced that they 
in the production of their rites and their temples, in the ordination and arrangement of all parts of their sacred orders and priesthoods, that they were fulfilling and dramatizing, revealing, expressing, symbolically setting forth the great primary psychic archetype, and therefore that the mysteries were a geometrical equivalent of the soul, and that just as surely as the mysteries themselves were the shadowed and formment of the soul of God, so they beckoned, called, or opened to the further shadowed extension of this principle, the soul of man. So we understand uh, the meaning of the term uh, that the neophyte or the initiate entering, entering the sacred house is described as going home. He is going back to the similitude of himself. He is going back to his own birth. He is going back to the place where he came from. He is going back to the state or condition which was eternally his, the condition of the great archetype of psyche in space. Thus he returns to the ancient house. He comes back again to the womb. He is returned to his own childhood. He is truly returned to his own infancy. He must come forth again by a new birth. A new birth in conformity with the archetype and with complete receptivity to the impression of the signatura rerum, the great seal or imprint of the archetypal purpose. The initiate, therefore, is supposed to and believed to carry within himself from the time of the mysteries the living archetype of the connection between his own psychic life and the psychic life of the universe. There was no longer any arrangement or disarrangement between these two. They had come together. And because his soul was like the world's soul, it could never be separated from it, because things which are alike can never be separate in time and space. The gradual edu education or edification of the, uh, the initiate through the continuation of his studies then became of one purpose only, namely that he would increase in skill and power and means for the expression of that which was his own internal. From that time on, he was instinctively and inevitably master of arts and sciences, because all these things are merely specializations of his own psyche. And as surely as art and music and literature and the dance and poetry and sculpturing and painting and all these things are manifest man's instinct to express beauty, so when the psyche is itself ordered in all matters, this beauty is immediately and eternally available, and it only remains for the initiate to experience and discover the ways in which it can be revealed. This is, in substance, the experience of the blessed theurgy described by Plotinus. It is this experience of the one returning to the one, the alone journeying to the alone. That which is like finding likeness, and the soul imprisoned in man, re freed and restored to the soul of the world, of which it is a proper fragment and an inevitable part. Thus the soul of the world, the mysteries of the soul of man, meet in the strange rites and rituals of the mother of the gods. And the soul in man finds its kinship, discovers its identity, realizes that it has long been in exile, and that it has found its way to reality. Then from there on, and for all eternity, according to the rites, this ritual can be revived, and the child coming into the world is born with the subjective realization of its own destiny, and somehow, strangely, gently, tenderly, wonderfully bound to the soul of the world. And from these who are thus bound and thus ordered and thus ordained come the teachers and leaders of the race. Now this is in substance the Julian position, and we can add to it in certain methods and ways. But it not only tells us to a large measure the story of Julian, but it perhaps helps us to summarize the entire concept of Neoplatonism. For this is a discipline by which the individual, 
of causes that which is the same to return to that with which it is the same. And that all of these disciplines, like those of the Indian schools, are disciplines of union. Union through the experience of similitude and then the experience of identity. When man's own inner soul is identical in quality and substance with the world soul, they meet, flow together, and become one, and can never again be separated. Part of this mystery is explained in the initiation rite, for in this ritual, the, and the initiate has, at least temporarily, this terrific experience. Later, perhaps, it fades somewhat from his mind, because his compound nature is not capable of preser preserving continuously so exalted a state of spiritual intensity. But even though the experience may not then be forever available or immediately accessible to him, still the memory of the experience then becomes the most blessed of all memories, and it also becomes the memory of truth or the memory of wisdom, the memory of health, the great good that cannot be forgotten, and which therefore is greater than the small evils and the uncertainties which can be forgotten. But nothing in the world, nothing that can happen to man, good or bad, can have the tremendous impact upon his spiritual life uh, that the motion of the soul to the recognition of its union with the great archetype can have. Therefore, in the presence of this, all doubts, all fears, all negations have no opportunity of presenting and maintaining themselves. Thus the initiate can never completely relapse. He can never forget. He can never fail to experience. He has known something. He has beheld the universe open around him and within him. He has come to know as realities things that other men can only believe or hope or wonder about. And having passed through the experience, he receives a strange and wonderful catharsis. And this experience of passing through of actually participating in the rite is the sacrament by which the benediction of the Spirit is bestowed. And in the presence of this benediction and under its tremendous influence, something happens in the psychic chemistry of the individual and the soul can never be as sick again as it was before. It can never forget, it can never stagger away and die again in matter because it has received the greatest impulse, the greatest uh, transference of energy from the world soul that it is possible for it to have. It therefore blazes within the being and causes the being more and more to become its servant until finally the initiate bows before this victorious and triumphant soul within himself and acknowledges himself to be its servant. And so Julian closes his thought or his wonderful dream pictures uh, with his prayer of thankfulness to the Great Mother, to the world soul, which has made it possible for him to come to her as a child to its parent, and find in this security of the great psychic mystery of the initiation, that strange and wonderful security that comes to the small child who returns to its parents' love and understanding. And Julian, as a small child, goes home to the mother and in going home finds peace and security and serenity. Thus he completes or concludes his dream of this great drama. And I think we have considerable reason to believe from his thought and from the works of his contemporaries that Julian indeed had had this experience, that it sustained him magnificently through the trials of a short and tragic life. And we will hope with Julian that it will cause him and to return again in due time with the memory of the greatness of this soul and the message and journey of the soul deep within himself, so that perhaps in again in his day he can become enlightened, can revive the mystery, and continue his dedication to the service of the Mother of the Gods. Well, I think that is...